Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to a wonderful Monday afternoon at Chem 170 Organic Chemistry with your host, me, Dr. White. I hope you all had a nice spring break. Boy, did I get a lot done around my house and everything. A lot, even though the list, my to-do list, I didn't get it all done. I still got a lot done. All right. I'm going to start off the lecture with a oops. Oops. <laughs> I made a mistake last week. I'm thinking, oh, we're at the end of the amines chapter, and next week is the test. Wrong. <laughs> I was off by one week. Sorry about that. That's why I haven't posted anything. I might have posted it. But not this week. A week from this Wednesday will be test three. I'll talk more about it on Wednesday. <clears throat> Excuse me. Because of that, on Wednesday, I will go through the amines and their derivatives problem set. I'll do that on Wednesday. So no test three this week. It's next week. I like the special effects. Yeah. Anyways, so I'm sorry. Oops. All right. Now, since you've been away from my... Dr. White for a while, unless you were having withdrawal symptoms and you watch YouTube videos. Did any of you happen to pick up a bottle of vinegar and think it contains acetic acid, a carboxylic acid? Did anybody happen to use nail polish remover? And that's ethyl acetate, an ester. Or Let's get into the good stuff. Did you happen to use a fabric softener or a mouthwash that contains a quaternary ammonium salt? Remember, Dr. White worked with quite a lot with quaternary ammonium salts and still do. I've got a number of US patents in there. Let's see, did I forget anything? Ah, it's getting spring out there. I don't know if any flowers have bloomed. But did you happen to smell a flower or a vegetable or a fruit and think about esters? Ooh, time for a Dr. White story. Just thought of it when I thought of flowers. I can still picture it. One time for a um, number of years, almost 15 years, I worked for two different European companies, international chemical companies that were mainly headquartered in the Netherlands. So I went to the Netherlands a lot. When I go there, I, I'd be there at least two to four weeks at a trip. And sometimes I'd also go to Germany and England. And I would stay this one company, Unichema Chemicals, which then was part of Unilever, and it was headquartered in Gouda. That's not the way it's pronounced. It's a team, uh, town where the cheese is from, and it's called Gouda. And I would stay in The Hague, which in the Netherlands is not called The Hague. It's called Den Haag. And I would stay in Den Haag and take a train, about a 20-minute ride to Gouda. And You'd be going through the countryside from uh, Den Haag to Gouda. And I can still picture this before cell phones. I didn't have a camera that one day or that one trip. Bad Dr. White. But anyways, you see, as far as the eye could see, fields of tulips. Yes, it's the Netherlands. And they're all in bloom. And the middle is one field was this huge windmill that usually had a sail out, so it was turning. What a beautiful day to, way to start your morning. All right, another thing I should do right now, because you've had a whole week off for me, is let's play that fun game, circle and name the functional groups, two points each. Let me get my pad and 
Ready? And there you go, a whole bunch of fun. Circle and name the functional group two points each. Enjoy. By the way, this is sort of crowded right here. So this is S -A N bracket C H three close bracket two. While you're doing that, I can go take a walk around the block. No, I'm not. <laughs> oh, it's bad humor Monday. Look out.
I should get some game show music to play while you're all working on the problem. And please be patient. I try and give everybody time to finish. There's a lot to do in this game. Circle and name the functional group or groups, two points each. All right, my turn. All right, how do you do this? You look for what's different, what's not carbon, what's not hydrogen, what's not a carbon-carbon single bond, should get your attention like that. If we look at A, ooh, oxygen, oxygens, we have a carbonyl, carbon double bond oxygen with a hydroxyl group and carbons. Now this you don't have to put down, but this is a carboxylic acid. Next, B, ooh, carbonyl, uh, same carbon, oxygen with a minus charge, sodium cation, carbons here. And what is this? It's a carboxylate anion, or you could have put salt, but I don't like that. This is my personal preference. Now, if we look at C, carbonyl again. Remember, Dr. White loves carbonyl groups, so does Mother Nature, with an oxygen with carbons on it, and carbons here. And I'm going to write this down here because I'm running out of space. I should have spread it out more. And what is this right here? An ester. And now we go to D. Ooh, nitrogen. Carbons here and here. And here our prime and our double prime can be hydrogen or they cannot, one or more. In this case, what is this? It's an amine. Tertiary amine, but I didn't ask you to learn primary, secondary, tertiary. And let's do E. Ooh, nitrogen again. Look for what's different. I did. I have carbons, 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 carbons. Ooh, and an anion. And here, remember, X can, for my class, can be a lot of things, but chlorine, bromine, or iodine. And what is this? 
is say, itinerary ammonium salt. As I mentioned before, it helped pay my mortgage, helped get me new cars, and quaternary ammonium salts got me around the world. So I worked for probably one of the largest worldwide producers of quaternary ammonium salts. When I was there, it was part of AXO, now called Nobel, but now it's been split out to a new group called, company called Nurion. And finally, Let's look at F. And what I'm going to do is give myself a little room. And now I have some room. So let's get to work. Ooh, nitrogen. And notice it has three methyls in the CH2 and an anion. And what is that? It's a quaternary ammonium salt. Right there. Ooh, nitrogen with carbons and hydrogen. And our prime and our double prime can be hydrogen. In this case, it is. And what's that? And a mean. For those who want to know, that's a primary mean, but you don't have to put that down. Are we done? Oh no, look right here. What do we have? We have not enough room. So I'm going to go over here. Carbonyl, hydroxyl group, carbons, that's a carboxylic acid. And we don't know. I threw everything in but the kitchen sink. And carbonyl, if you circle that carbon, that's okay. And let's go up here, our group. Carbonyl, nitrogen to that carbonyl, and our prime and our double prime, both either one or none, can be hydrogen. And what's this? It's an amide. And that's how you play that fun game. Circle and name the functional group or groups in the following two points each. Now, what I've been really sneakily doing, I don't know, is that a word, sneakily? <laughs> that doesn't sound right. Been very sneaky doing, that sounds better, is I've been training you to look at a molecule and identify the functional groups. Because if you can't do that, how can you name it? If you can't do that, how can you know how it reacts? That's the key part of organic chemistry. Hopefully have fun. Speaking about amides, you remember I talked about last week capsaicin, which is the amide in peppers. The more capsaicin and the hotter it is. I told you about the stupidest thing I've done a long time, years ago, like that with some powdered habanero. Now, over to break, one of my favorite shows is Diners 
drive-ins and dives with Guy Fieri on the Food Channel. I like that. <clears throat> and they had a repeat. They have a lot of repeats, but they're still fun to watch. Where he was at some restaurant where they had these burn your tongue off, super hot chicken wings. And to share in the fun, he had part of his crew eat with him the chicken wing. And it was funny, takes one bite, all of a sudden he's in pain. How does he get rid of it? Drink some milk. Why milk? Because not the watered milk, but I'll teach you later, not this cha next chapter, two chapters. Principal light dissolves light. Capsaicin is nonpolar, and the fat in milk is nonpolar, and that's how you get the heat out of your mouth. <laughs> I don't know about your stomach. Uh, I'm not a fan of super, super hot. All right. Hopefully you all play, enjoyed playing that fun game, circle and name the functional group. Now, because I thought this week was going to be a test, I rushed through something. And now I can go back and cover it. All right. Switch is click totally off. But this is something I think you'd be interested in. Now, there's a functional group, which I'm not going to cover in detail, but I'd like to talk about it. And that's called the diazole group. And that's an aromatic ring, in this case, the simplest, a benzene ring, with a nitrogen, two of them, that that two nitrogens bond together, have a plus charge, and all molecules in nature have a net zero charge. In this case, the anion is usually chloride. Diazo compounds can react with other aromatic compounds to form what's called a coupling compound. And this new functional group is called the nasal group. Again, switches off. Oh, look, it even says it on the slide here. This will not be on a test. Now, azo dyes were created by a German chemist whose name escapes me right now. Back in the late 1800s, made him very wealthy. And depending on what groups are on the benzene ring, this is different colors. If we're in a classroom right now, I tell everybody, look around, see all the colors people are wearing their clothes. That's due to azo dyes. My top, which is a very dark blue, azo dye. Now, centuries ago, before the invention of azo dyes, all cloth, if you wouldn't know, weren't very, very, very rich, was white except for one group, one person in a company, country, and that's the king. And they had their clothes dyed a very dark blue. And that used the indigo dye, which is still off. There's a structure. It's very dark blue. So dark blue because only the king and royalty could afford it, it was called Royal Blue. Now, switch is still off, but I'd like to talk about an area that I'm in no way taking a stands other than you shouldn't really do what I'm going to talk about or use, but I'm talking about the organic chemistry, and that's the alkaloids. Alkaloids are nitrogen-containing compounds extracted from plants. And alkaloids have a major, 
major physiological effect on your body, including your brain. What? Again, switches off. Now, you should be able to see the structure of morphine. And each bend in a line is a carbon. Each end in a line, which this doesn't have. And notice right here in the lower right-hand corner, there's a tertiary mean. Methyl group, carbon on this ring, the CH2 right in this bed. Also has double bond, alcohol, ether, benzene ring with a hydrox group, a phenolic. And this is a painkiller. During World War II, it was extensively used to treat soldiers who were wounded in battle. Now, let's talk about another molecule, and that's codeine. Codeine is almost identical to morphine. This is a different way of drawing the same structure, except this hydrox group on the benzene ring is now an ether. And codeine is a excellent painkiller. I mean, really excellent. Do I have time? I do. Back when I was in the summer of my fifth grade, I came down with asthmatic bronchitis, not fun at all. And most of the summer, I spent in my house, parents' house, because I was coughing so much, I was essentially bedridden. Now, my father was a pharmacist, and at that time, he owned his own drugstore. Later on, he sold it, and he became chief pharmacist, and used to be called let's see, Presbyterian St. Luke's, right off the um, Eisenhower Expressway. I forgot by what exit. I think they've changed the name a little. That was decades ago. And being a pharmacist with his own drugstore, he brought back home a quart bottle, a big quart bottle of elixir terpenhydrate with coating. It's probably one of the best cough medicines ever made. Used to be you go and sign. I don't know if they even offer it anymore because of the coating. And what was it? 80 proof alcohol and coating. And boy, that stopped your cough. And you also felt good. Well, luckily by the end of summer, I was getting better and almost done with my asthmatic bronchitis. But every morning, I take about two or three tablespoons of that cough medicine, elixir terpenhydrate with coating, which was 80% alcohol with coating. And one morning, my father saw me doing that and says, you know, you don't need that anymore. You're not coughing. I said, but it makes me feel good. He said, yeah, I bet it does. <laughs> Think about it. It was the same as taking a shot of alcohol or two and some coding and going to school. Boy, did I feel good. He took the bottle back to his drugstore. It was good stuff. And over the years, till they've come down on it, you could get it. Now, here's coding. Now, an illegal, illegal drug, heroin. Now, heroin has this structure. And what's the difference between heroin and morphine? The two hydroxyl groups, OH, alcohols, are made into what we call acetate esters. Now, it turns out you can convert morphine. I'm not going to go into chemical reactions because it's illegal and I don't want to teach you things like that, into more heroin also, which means the government found out drug, illegal drug manufacturers would go and get things like elixir terpenhydrate and convert it into heroin. So that's why they put a stop on that. Now, again, this is a nitrogen containing compound. Notice it's a tertiary amine there. And morphine, 
codeine, heroin have the same base structure. Now, another alkaloid is cocaine. And you've heard about it in the news or in movies, you know how they say, any of you ever see the great TV show, Miami Vice, that was on the 80s. But still once, I think they still have it on some cable. But it was a great program, TV program. And obviously dealt with drugs being smuggled into Miami and other things like that. And you'd hear, or you can see in movies, ah, five keys of cocaine are coming in tonight at midnight. And they're talking about this molecule. Notice the nitrogen here. That line means there's a methyl tertiary amine. Now, how these drugs or illegal drugs affect your mind, I have no idea. I'm not a medical doctor, I'm a chemist. Now, one more I'd like to talk about, which over the last couple of decades has been very, very dangerous to people, is methamphetamine. And methamphetamine at room temperature is a white crystalline material, which is now has a street name, crystal meth. And this has the secondary mean, a couple of carbons and a benzene ring. And this has a very, very detrimental effect on your body. Now, I don't know if I mentioned this, but if you're a member of the American Chemical Society, it used to be every week, now I think it's every month, uh, you get a great magazine, which if you go to your local ma library, you should be able to find also, called Chemical Engineering News. Everybody just calls it CNE News. And articles in CNE News for decades now have been spot on, honest, really informative. And after crystal meth have been starting to cause problems in our society about a year or two after it was introduced, they had a great article on it. I can still remember some of it. And the thing I remember in that article, is said, unlike other illegal drugs, crystal meth is so addictive Use it one time and you get addicted. One time you get addicted to it. Luckily, I don't use drugs. My friends and their family, I don't know anybody does illegal drugs. And so I don't have experience with that, luckily, but that was in CNE News and I believe it. Now, here, this is ecstasy. I don't know if they still use that or for a while in raves, uh, clubs, people would take this and it gives you a high like all these do. And this is a structure of ecstasy and it's made from a derivative of a sassafras where you convert this ketone into this amine. I'm not gonna show you how to do it. Dr. White knows how to do it. But I won't do it because I don't want a someone from the government knocking on my door, holding guns and arresting me. B, I don't want someone who's a, making illegal drugs knocking at my door with guns and killing me. So I don't do, make illegal drugs. Now, last week I talked about heterocyclic compounds. And the thing you should remember is you should know a heterocyclic compound is a compound containing or molecule containing carbon atoms and other atoms in a ring. And these other atoms are called heteroatoms. And you should know that's either oxygen or nitrogen. So you should know that the definition of a heterocyclic compound is a molecule containing carbon and other atoms in a ring, and those other atoms are oxygen and nitrogen. 
Now I asked you to learn one compound, pyridine. Pyridine looks like benzene, except one of the carbons has been replaced by nitrogen. Now, switch is off. Like I said, Mother Nature is probably one of the greatest of all organic chemists. Switch is totally off. How many of you have heard that to be healthy, especially if you're young or pregnant, you should have a lot of folic acid in your diet? And Dr. White eats the spinach and other green vegetables, leafy vegetables for folic acid and other health reasons. And I like them too. And this is a structure of folic acid. If you notice right here, the bottom, there's a very complex heterocyclic compound. You also have an amine here, benzene ring, amide, and two carboxyl gases. And how this helps you stay healthy, I have no idea, but medical science has proved it does. And I believe them. Now, switch is still off. A five-member ring is called parole. And it turns out parole rings are part of something very important in your body. And we call those, first, let me make this smaller. And we call those porphyrins. And if you look at this ring, again, switches off, you have essentially four porphyrin rings connected with a couple of CH2s to form this is called a parole. Now, certain paroles are very important in our life. One is if you have an iron in the center here and this attached to some proteins. We call that hemoglobin. <laughs> you know, the stuff in your blood that brings oxygen to wherever oxygen is needed and takes away carbon dioxide and other ways. And if there's a magnesium in the center and there's other uh, proteins attached to that, we call that chlorophyll. If you look outside, all the things that are growing that are green use photosynthesis, which needs chlorophyll to convert sunlight into energy to do chemical reactions. So is a porphyrin ring important? You bet your last dollar it is. And here's an example of heme. Sorry about that. And if we go to my favorite wrong place, You'll see here, you can't see it in the center, but that's your porphyrin ring. And these little ribbons of red and blue are your proteins some surrounded by it. If you notice right here, they say respectively hemoglobin subunits and are surrounded by heme. And here's an example of a heme which can absorb oxygen and transfer it. Quite interesting. When I was at Michigan State, who was that? Dr. Legoff, Dr. Professor Legoff, 
he did and his research group did a lot of research with poor friends. The group I was in didn't, did other things, carbonyl groups. Now, switch still off. Indols are this molecule. And one of the indols is tryptophan. And that's contained in serotonin that affects your brain. Now, the last one is this compound. Again, switches off. This base ring heterocyclic compound, carbon and other atoms, in this case, nitrogen, four of them, is called a purine. Now, it turns out purine is the base skeleton for things like caffeine, which my cardiologist has reminded me because I have problems with my blood pressure, keep it low. And also, you don't think about it, but cocoa has theobromine. And it's also purine are key building blocks in your DNA and RNA. But let's take a look at something. This is the structure of caffeine. Notice you've got the purine ring system, carbonyl here, carbonyl here, methyl groups on the three or four nitrogens. And if you don't know, you can get addicted to caffeine. I have been in my life, both from too much tea and a long time ago, I was a heavy Coca-Cola drinker, which has a lot of caffeine in it. Now, how many of you, and I'm not, but I have a friend who is, know someone who's a chocoholic. They just love to eat, notice, eat chocolate. They're addicted to chocolate. And why is that? Here's the structure of theobromine, the key ingredient in cocoa, chocolate. And it's almost identical to caffeine, except on the nitrogen between the two carbon, carbonyl groups. In caffeine, there's a methyl group. In theobromine, there's a hydrogen. And for some reason, some people, even though there's no methyl group, they get addicted to theobromine the same way most people get addicted to caffeine. Why? Don't know. I'm not a medical doctor. But if you go in for certain blood tests or other types of tests where caffeine will throw things off, they'll tell you 24 hours or 12 hours before, usually 12, don't have anything with caffeine. They remind you, you know, tea, coffee, and they also tell you chocolate because your body, most, a lot of people react your blood pressure, especially to the theobromine, just like caffeine. All right, we've covered everything for test number three. And on Wednesday, I will go through the amines and derivatives, amides and, uh, amides, amines and quaternary ammonium salt problem set in the lecture. All right, oh, we've still got a couple minutes. So guess what time it is? It's new chapter time, new functional group. Now, as I mentioned last week, I won't go through any more general reactions except one or two that won't be on test, and later on one that's a slight modification. But essentially, we've gone through all the general reactions that you need to know for this class. Now it's time to do the fun part take it out into the real world. And the new chapter is synthetic polymers. 
Now, what is a polymer? Oop, I haven't been subtle all day. Dr. White's being subtle. And know this, you should know what is a polymer. You should know a polymer is a macromolecule. Macromolecule means huge. I mean, huge molecule built by repetitive linking of smaller units called monomers. So a polymer is a macromolecule, a huge, very huge molecule built by repetitive linking of smaller units called monomers. Now, I won't ask this on a test, but in polymer, the poly means many, the mer means unit, and when we talk about a monomer, that's one unit. Now, if you've ever been stuck at a train crossing with a long freight train, whenever I do that, get stuck, I think of the boxcars and the whole train like a polymer. And the boxcars are the monomers, the repeating unit. But in a polymer, it's huge. It makes the train look tiny. If I look at the clock, it's time for a break. So let's take about a five minute break. I can get up and stretch and we'll come back and talk about polymers.
Time to get going. All right. Now, I should mention something about polymers. I'm going to talk about polymers, maybe spend an hour, hour and a half lecturing. I have a number of patents in US patents and polymers, so I know quite well. I could easily, easily give a two semester graduate level course on polymers, but I'm going to just in about an hour, hour and a half, teach you key things about polymers you should know. All right. Let's go back. Remember, a polymer is a macromolecule, macro meaning huge, huge, really huge molecule built by repetitive linking of smaller units called mon monomers. Now, when we switch is on, when we talk about polymers, there are two key ways of, of classifying polymers. One is based on chemistry. I should have a separate slide. Wrong thing, hold on. Right thing. All right, there's two ways of classifying polymers. One is by chemistry, one is by a key physical property. So let's look at the chemistry. And the two types of polymers based on chemistry are addition polymers and condensation polymers. And once again, I'm missing a slide. It's today, Friday the 13th. Actually, it's a Friday the 13th, so our good days. All right, let's talk about addition polymers. I'll do it the old fashioned way, write it on the whiteboard. So what's an addition polymer? By the way, subtle time, didn't know this. An addition polymer is a polymer All right, an addition polymer is a polymer made from only one type of monomer. 
That means the same group is repeating over and over and over and over again. And that's an addition polymer. And a condensation polymer is a polymer made from two or more different monomers so an addition polymer you should know is a polymer made from only one type of monomer a condensation polymer is a monomer made from two or more different types of monomers now what's an example of an addition polymer, which you should know. Rubber. Example of an item made from a addition polymer is a rubber tire. Now, how many of you are familiar with the plastic wrap used in the kitchen? One brand name is called Saran Wrap. And that's a I use the trade name, sort of like Kleenex. Even if you're using puffs, people will still say, Can you give me a Kleenex? It's a generic name from a trade name. These are examples of addition polymers. Now in saran wrap, and this you don't have to know, is made from ethylene. And we call that polyethylene is the chemical name. And here's the structure of saran wrap or polyethylene. Now, when Dr. White says huge molecule, this is CH2, CH2 repeated N times. What's N? About a million or more. Yep, a million carbons. I don't know about you, but in my book, that's huge, which we call macromolecule. Now, rubber is made from uh, a siren, um, isoprene. And this you don't have to know. And pure rubber, like from the rubber trees, has this structure. Again, N is huge, anywhere from three quarter of a million to a million or more. And that's repeating over and over and over again. Just like the same boxcar you see a hundred times in a long freight train. Now, what are examples of condensation polymers? My water bottle or pop bottle. Remember, I'm from Chicago and we call the stuff in a bottle or can that's carbonated non alcoholic pop, not soda. And this material is made up of a carboxylic acid, 
reacting with an alcohol to form an ester. And you make long chains that are held together. The thing that links the polymers together, by the way, if you're a train enthusiast like Dr. White is, and I learned that from my father, we used to go to the south side of Chicago where they had the train yards where they'd be moving engines around and working on them. Oh, what a great memory or memories. And I'm a model railroader, that's one of my hobbies. And the knuckle coupler, that's what I'm doing now, is what holds boxcars together. And in a polyester, the ester function holds the diacid, usually their difunctional group, together. Now, another one, if I could spell it, and you should know examples of items in our daily life. and a nylon jacket or pantyhose. They still call them pantyhose? I don't know, but anyways, nylon is a polyamide. And carboxylic acid and amines are formed together to form amides but they link together like boxcars. Here you'd have a train with two different types of boxcars and that amide functionality is called nylon. Now the story goes, and I don't know if it's true or not, that in World War II, because of the different sides, the Allies and Axis Japanese army cut off access to certain chemicals to make nylon, or actually I should back that up. Oop, oop, oop. Japanese island army blocked off the American army or country and other countries that were fighting Japan from access to silk. What was silk used for? Parachutes for the war. Well, organic chemists came through, and I think it was DuPont, came up with nylon. And nylon was a replacement for silk to make parachutes for the war effort. And they did. Now, right around the end of the war, one, the story goes, I don't know if this is urban legend or true, but it sounds good. Uh, one of the chemists involved in creating, discovery and making nylon, his wife was complaining, I can't get any silk stockings. The silk's going to the war effort or went to it. And he had the brilliant idea to take and make the equivalent of silk stockings out of nylon. And that's how they got the same nylons. And they evolved first in the nylons, hosiery, and then to pantyhose and a whole lot of other things too. Now, another type of met way of classifying polymers is by a key physical property. And it's time for me to be subtle again. Know this. All right, what is that key physical property? And that's the two types are thermoplastic and thermal set. You should know what is a thermoplastic molecule or a polymer. That's one once formed 
like the shape of a bottle, can be reheated to form a new shape. You can recycle these, I do, and I hope you do. An example of those are polyesters, like this bottle, nylon, and polyethylene, also you know it as kitchen wrap or saran wrap. Those can all be reheated and reshaped. Now, it turns out there's no correlation between if a polymer is a addition or condensation polymer and if it's a thermoplastic polymer. You have to go into the lab and find out. If you gave me a molecule of a polymer and say, is that a thermoplastic polymer? Don't know, I'd have to check, unless I knew it was polyester or nylon. Now, the other type of the key physical property is called a thermoset. And a thermoset polymer, once formed, cannot be reheated to form a new shape. An example of that would be rubber, like rubber tires. Phenolic resins, if you have buttons that are non-metallic, those are made with phenolic resins. And urethanes, which I'll talk more about, there are two types, rigid, I have poly, uh, patents in urethane polymers, so I know this area really good. And there's rigid, and I'll talk more about it, used for insulation, like in your refrigerator or your house for insulation, or flexible, like in your seat cushions, like in your car, your couches, and your pillows. Now. Rubber is a thermal set. Once it's formed, it can't be reheated to form a new shape. If you've ever seen pictures or videos from certain areas of the world under a lot of upheaval and unrest, you'll see people barricading a street with tires they set on fire. And why can they do that? because it's a thermal set. It doesn't melt. It can't be reshaped like a polyester. It just burns. And over the last 20, 30 years, some of the worst fires have been at tire, used tire dumps. Let's see something. I've never done this before. So everybody see on their screen now, the pictures like from the Wall Street Journal, you see that tire dump and the fire. This is one of the hardest fires to put out. It's just really hot and really hard to put out. A lot of times they just let it burn for a couple of years. Yep. So you should know there are two, based on a key physical property, there are two types of polymers. One is a thermoplastic, which is you should know once form can be reheated to form a new shape. And you should know examples of that, like a polyester water bottle or pop bottle. Nylon jacket. And saran wrap polyethylene. Thermoset, you should know, once shape, once form, cannot 
be reheated to form a new shape. And you should know, same thing up here for the examples, rubber tires, phenolic resins, urethanes are examples of thermoset. Now, I'm gonna turn the switch off, click, but this is an interesting, important part of our of polymers and it plays an important role in our daily life. And polymers, addition polymers, remember that's one with only one type of monomer, mainly form via what's called free radical polymerization. I could do a semester to graduate course on free radical chemistry, which we're not gonna get into in this class. And this is the same monomer repeating, reacting with itself. Now, most addition monomers are molecules with a double bond. And you have something called an initiator, radical initiator. It has an electron, again, switches off, and it attacks this to form a new radical. Sometimes this is forms a radical and is not bonded to it. And I'll talk about what is L, uh, polymer chemists use was attached to the double bond L. Now here you have a radical, doesn't have a charge, has that very energetic electron, and you have more of the monomer. Again, right now, switches off, Dr. Hoyt's having some fun. And this attacks that. to form this and again, switches off. I don't need the brackets. And you have another radical. And this can react with more of the monomer to add on another group to the point where this is the repeating unit and N is on the order of anywhere depending on the polymer, half a million to million, million and a half. They're huge. Now, switch is still off. Now, when the monomer where L is hydrogen, you have ethylene, that's the common name, and that forms polyethylene, and that's saran wrap. Now, if instead of a hydrogen on the double bond, you have a methyl group, this is called propylene. And because when you make a monomer, I mean a polymer, it's polypropylene. How many of you ever bought something like a flash drive or other things that's on a sheet of paper or cardboard and it's got that plastic bubble over it protecting it? You know how hard it is to get that off and break through that? That's polypropylene, that bubble that goes over whatever is on being protected that you're buying. Now, when L is a benzene ring, we call that styrene, and the polymer is called polystyrene. How many of you have ever had? the white foam cup, that insulated cup for your coffee or cold beverages. Or if you go to a big box store, you can buy those very inexpensive, but very fragile, you gotta be careful, foam white coolers. And that's made up of polyethylene. Now, here are some other molecules 
And when L is a chlorine, this is called vinyl chloride. Again, switches off. And it makes the polymer polyvinyl chloride, also known as PVC. If you look under your kitchen or bathroom sinks and you see the white pipes, that's PVC, polyvinyl chloride. Now, when the carbons both have fluorines, this makes polytetrafluoroethylene. Nope, everybody calls that Teflon. And that molecule and other derivatives like that are some of the lining or coating for your nose stick pots and pans. All right, now, switches back on. Let's talk about the effects of cross-linking. Hmm, what's cross-linking? Well, let's consider you have original rubber and you have these long molecules of rubber. Think of it as pieces of string. If you pull it this way, it's strong. But if you pull it this way, it falls apart. And the original rubber that came from the rubber trees was this goopy, I like that scientific term, gooey mess that wasn't too useful. Well, how did they make it useful? By cross-linking. Cross-linkings, and IE means that is in Latin, are chemical bonds between the long polymer chains. Now, if I have the rubber molecules, polymers, if I somehow bond them like this, the squiggly lines are chemical bonds between that, still gonna be strong this way, but this way is gonna be very strong. And that's called cross-linking. And it makes polymers more rigid, stronger, and affects other physical properties. Time for an interesting story. How many of you are familiar with the company called Goodyear? And they make rubber tires. Well, it turns out around the early 1800s, a very inventive person, I think it was Charles Goodyear, a number of people were trying to make rubber that came from the rubber tree useful. And they are all working on cross-linking. And Goodyear was the first person who came up and he had a patent to find a way to cross-link rubber polymers, the polymer, to make it useful, like you know, for tires. Or, oh, here's a word I haven't used in ages, collages. And they still even use that. You know, shoes that you put on over your uh, rubber shoes or flashes that protect your feet from water. Well, the sad story about that is Goodyear was an alcoholic and a couple of very smart businessmen learned about his patent, saw the money involved and said, we'll give you a lot of money if you sell us your patent rights, which he did. And part of that agreement was, because he was known for it, you let us use your name for our company. And he did. There's never been a good year on the Goodyear Rubber Company's Board of Directors or President. And the sad part is he got a tremendous amount of money for that time and he drank it all away, such as life. If you're reading a book, we're skipping sections 14, 3, 4, 5, and 6. Let's talk about condensation polymers. You should know 
they're made with two or more different types of monomers. Now, I'm going to turn the switch off for the rest of the slide. Hold on, I got to use the right hand. Click. But each monomer has two or more functional groups, such as a diol, di meaning two, ol alcohol, or diacet or diester. And this really should be a diacet. And you make functional groups you're familiar with, esters or amides. Now, I'll talk a little about other functional groups called urethanes and an area which is near and dear to my heart because I worked in this area for a number of years, phenolic resins, which are made by reacting phenol, a benzene ring with a hydroxyl group, and formaldehyde. Now, I'll briefly talk about epoxy functional groups to make epoxy resins. Now, what's a polyester? And we went through this when we talked about esters. Let's go again. It's a reaction in which a polycarboxylic acid or a derivative of that reacts with a polyol. Polyol means a molecule of more than one alcohol. And hopefully you'll know for test number three, Now here, I have my carboxylic acid, my alcohol, acid catalyst. Now here, I have it with a carboxylic acid. Normally, you'll use a acid chloride and you don't need a, I look like a smiley face. This reacts just like a carboxylic acid, but much faster. And here we have an alcohol two of them. And you have this molecule. This side can make more ester. This side can make more ester. Keeps on growing and growing and growing like the Energizer Bunny, bang, bang, bang. Oh, I brought a commercial in. And that's a polyester. And you should know plastic bottles like this are polyesters. Now, polyamides are molecules in which you react a carboxylic acid, a poly, meaning more than one, carboxylic acid or derivative like an acid chloride with a polyamine. And a polyamine means more than one amino group in a molecule. Now here's an example. You take this amine, diamine, and this di or uh, acid chloride, you form amide linkage that repeats over and over again, where N is large, like a million. And what you learned in class, hopefully you know this for test number three, coming up next week, you form an amide. Now this right here will form an amide with that carbonyl. Now this side can react with more of this amine to form more amide. This amine can form more with this acid chloride to form more amide, and you get this repeating unit. Now this repeating unit, this polymer, because it has the benzene rings in it, is very strong and it can be weaved into a material that's somewhat flexible. It has a name. When you take sheets of this material and put them on top, the polymer is called Kevlar and that makes the bulletproof vest polysius. Those are Kevlar 
bulletproof vest. Now, this is called, when we talk about what's called urethane polymers, this is a functional group, again, switches off. But I thought I'd introduce you to this scenario I work in, have worked in, still consult in. This is called an isocyanate. And it's very, very reactive, like a carboxylic acid. Oops, wrong one. And a urethane reaction is an isocyanate reacting with an alcohol. And you use the tertiary amine catalyst, you know what a tertiary amine is, to form a urethane. Now, I don't think I can write on here. Here, yes, I can. There should be a hydrogen there. So urethane. has this functionality. And later on the semester, we'll be doing a lab with polymers. And if we were face to face, you would be making a polyurethane. Now in real life, you'd use what's called a diisocyanate. Know something, I was wrong. There shouldn't be a hydrogen that one. I was right on this one. Even Dr. White makes mistakes. And this reacts with a diol or polyol. where you have more than two. And this reacts with this and this reaction, and you form a polyurethane that repeats over and over again. Now, one of the interesting polymers that's used is sucrose, table sugar. And notice each of the alcohols here, to make it more useful, they first reacted with ethylene oxide to form an ether oxide. And then that's used to make things like rigid foam for insulation. Now, in chemistry, chemical industry, sometimes a lot of good things happen. Sometimes very tragic things happen. I think you're all familiar with the derailment uh, that happened in, what was that, Ohio, I think, recently in the ex toxic fumes that were released. Well, Years ago, in a town in India called Bhopal, Bhopal, there was a disaster. 
and over a half million people were exposed to very hazardous chemical. And here they have over 2,000 people were immediately killed from that exposure. In real life, or in real, from what I've heard, the number of deaths immediate were a lot higher. The Indian government kept that low. If you notice, here they talk about almost 4,000 people were killed overall, and so probably a lot higher. Now, what happened, this is uh, interesting. At that time, I was working with urethane, so I know about isocyanates. And as it was, I worked at a company, Axo, that had flex time. You get there early and leave early. And how early? We well, could start at seven in the morning and you leave eight and a half hours later. And that was good because I could miss most of the rush hour traffic. The company I worked for was not far from Brookfield Zoo. And at one point, I lived by um, Sheridan and Lunch at a corner by Loyola University. The other, I moved out to where I am now, Schaumburg. Either way, it was a long trip. So anyways, I had a habit of getting up about five in the morning, get ready, leave by 6, 6.15, get there before seven, I'm out of there by 3.30, which is good, Miss traffic. Well, one morning, I'm waking up, my clock radio goes on. I always beat it, but I still had it to turn on. And I'm listening to the news in my bed. All of a sudden, I hear about, well, Paul, they're saying there's a massive explosion or release of methyl isocyanate, which is also not used to make urethanes, but used to make certain, I believe, insect repellents or other products. And half asleep, I'm thinking, what idiot got water in the isocyanate tank? And that's unfortunately what happened. Somebody put water, pumped water into the isocyanate tank. It reacted very violently with the methyl isocyanate to the point where the heat given off, it's called an exotherm, blew up the tank, vaporized the unreacted isocyanate, methyl isocyanate, and got in the air. That gets into your lungs. It ties up your lungs from transferring oxygen and you die or you're severely injured for the rest of your life. So good things happen with chemicals. Sometimes if you're not careful, bad things. Now, another area near and dear to my heart is phenolic resins. And that's the reaction of phenol with formaldehyde. And this forms a reaction similar to an aldol type condensation. I don't have it on the board, but If you see on your screen, you'll see right here, they have a three-dimensional. This is a phenolic resin, actually called a pre-resin. You make this, then it further when you cure it, polymerizes to make a macromolecule. Now, if you notice, here's a benzene ring. Here's what was formaldehyde. And this can react at the ortho and para positions. And this keep on going and going. And because of all those benzene rings, this is very strong. And it's also very, how should I put this, chemically inert. It's hard to break this down. And what's one of the big uses for that? One is, or well, all of them, most of them, are as resins. And resins are a way of gluing things together. Resin is a fancy way of saying a glue. 
No, I worked for Borden Chemical, now Hexion, which was probably and still is one of the largest manufacturer of phenolic resins. And where are they used? Well, you take sheets of wood, you can glue them together with formaldehyde or from all resins. And that's how they make plywood. You take pieces of wood and glue them together to make sheets of wood. That's how they make what's called oriented strand board for construction. If you take a little sawdust, you can make what's called particle board also used for construction. Now, if you have the wrong, too much free formaldehyde, I already talked about this, that gets exposed and it's bad health-wise. Now, I worked in the part of Borden that made phenolic resins mainly for foundries. And what's a foundry? Hold on while I get something. This is sand held together by a phenolic resin. Turns out the resin that holds this together, I invented, yay. And these are called dog bones. And they're a way of measuring an important uh, aspect of that resin. How strong does the bond of the phenolic resin, the glue, hold the sand together? Now there's a device called an instron, and you put the shape in there, it has clamps here and here, and it pulls it apart until it breaks. Since I invented this resin, I made it fancy with a couple of little rhinestones or whatever you call these. I gave some away to people who helped me make this in the plant. But the resin that I used to make this was a resin that cut down the pollution when you make a casting, like your car engine. Not actually, yeah. What you do is you make a mold out of this, and then you pour metal in there, liquid metal, and it makes hardens at the same time the heat of metal causes the phenolic resin to break down and a lot of fumes are given off. If you ever near a foundry, it stinks. Well, I came up with a very safe, much safer, low VOC volatile organic compound resin. And the nice thing about it was some of our customers who use that, like Ford and GM, I was invited to their plants. And a nice story, you can see I'm smiling now. In Windsor, right across from Detroit, Ford has the Ford Windsor foundry where they make V8 engines and V6 engines. And the superintendent of that called up our company and said, we know Dr. White invented this, could he come and visit? We'd like to thank him. And the company said, sure. And I went down there with the salesman to the Windsor plant. They showed me all around, it's amazing. I've also been in GM plants too, and Chrysler foundries where they make V6 and V8 engines. And they were making V8 engines with my resin. The molds were made with my resin. And the plant superintendent, a lot of the workers came up and thanked me because it no longer stunk and was as hazardous in the foundry. And the foundry managed superintendent, they called the manager superintendent, told me all of a sudden the neighborhood, because it didn't stink anymore as much, the people who lived near the foundry called them and thanked them. So that's a good part of chemistry. Like I said, everything you wanted to know about polymers in an hour or less. Let's go back and just review a few things real quick. Did you catch all that? All right. You should know what is a polymer. 
It's a macromolecule built by repetitive linking of smaller units called monomers. Now, there are different ways of classifying polymers. One is by its chemistry, the other a key physical property. And you should know there are two types of chemistry involved making polymers. One is an addition polymer. And you should know an addition polymer is made from only one type of monomer. And you should know examples of addition polymers, like three points. Give an example of an item in your daily life made from an addition polymer, or that's made from an addition polymer. An example would be a rubber tires, saran wrap would be another item. And you should know what's a condensation polymer. That's the other type of chemistry used to make polymers. And you should know that a condensation polymer is a polymer made from two or more different monomers. And you should know what's an example of an item in your daily life that's a condensation polymer made from it. Plastic bottles, nylon jackets, I guess you could put down pantyhose. Next, the other way of identifying polymers is by a key physical property. And there are two types, thermoplastic, thermoset. You should know, once formed, a thermoplastic once formed can be reheated to form a new shape. And examples of thermoplastic Items are polyester water bottle, nylon jackets, and saran wrap, which is called polyethylene. Now, a thermal set is a polymer once formed, cannot be reheated to form a new shape. An example of that would be a rubber tire or your buttons that are not metal. Ooh, do I have time? I have to sneak it in. When I was at Borden, we made phenolic resins, and one group which I was involved in, the phenolic resin was used to hold pieces of wood, little ones together. Are you ready for this? To make toilet seats. Now, another one that was a small part of our business, but it was good for PR, is the phenolic resin held the material together to make the cones of rocket ships that send satellites into outer space. Now, if I look at the clock, it's time to take a five minute break. I can get up and stretch and I'll see you in five minutes.
Let's get going. I, I was doing my review of what I just went through. And talked about addition polymers, free radical switch was off here. Gave you an example of key monomers, switch was off, switch was on. You should know what is cross-linking. Cross-linking are chemical bonds between long polymer chains. And this makes it much more stable. Oh my goodness. Nope, I shouldn't have had a V8. Oh, I got brainwashed by commercials. How many of you have ever smelled rubber burning? It stinks. Why does it stink? Well, rubber, the pure polymer that's not cross-linked, doesn't stink. How many of you have heard of vulcanization of rubber? I'm not talking about Star Trek. <laughs> right? Ways. That's where you form cross-linking. That's what Goodyear invented. And what's used to do the cross-linking? Sulfur. And sulfur, if you burn it, stinks. And that's why rubber, when you burn it, stinks. And I gave you some examples of different types of polymers. Now, like I said, well, I could do a whole two semester course, I've done in less than 50 minutes, just a quick taste of polymers. And if you look around, see the plastic here, polymer, polymer, your skin, you could almost say is a polymer. Your skin is a polyamide made from amino acids, which we'll talk about later on. Now, one of the things, don't tell anybody, but if we were face to face, on Mondays, we'd meet like we normally do. And on Wednesday, I'd only have 50 minutes of lecture, then we go into the lab. But since our lab is online, I cheated, I don't know if cheating is the right term, I spent more time in the lab on Wednesdays where we don't have to go in the lab because we're on Zoom and talked about lecture. So we're way ahead of schedule. So I'm gonna start a new chapter, which we're supposed to start next week. I'll just give you a little start and then we'll end early. Not everybody start clapping. And first of all, I have to open up that chapter. Now, this new chapter, I have to be honest with you, this is another part of the chemical industry I worked in for a number of years. And so you'll get to learn a lot more about this than most people do. And what is that new chapter? That's lipids and detergents. Now, I'm never gonna ask on a test, what's a lipid? That's a constituent, something you get from plants or animals that are characterized by their solubility properties. Again, right now, switches off, and lipids are insoluble in water, but are soluble, and I'll teach you what the word nonpolar means, and nonpolar solvents like ether, hexane, gasoline's nonpolar too. So lipids are something that comes from plants or animals and humans too, us, that are not soluble in water, 
but are soluble in what we call nonpolar organic solvents. Now, switch is on. I better be subtle. Can't know this. There are two types of lipids. One is saponifiable and one is non saponifiable. And what is a non -sapon or saponifiable lipid? It's a lipid that can be hydrolyzed under alkaline conditions. That means base. some water, yield the salts of what we'll call fatty acids, otherwise known as carboxylate anions. And I'll teach you about fatty acids. I worked for a company in the south side of Chicago, Unichema, where I was the laboratory manager for all of North America, where we made fatty acids to the tune of about uh, two to four million pounds a week. Yes two to four million pounds a week. That's getting big scale. Now, a non-saponifiable lipid does not undergo hydrolysis reactions in alkaline solutions. In other words, no reaction Non-saponifiable lipids are no undergo, do not undergo hydrolysis reaction in base alkaline solutions. In other words, there's no reaction with base and water, where saponifiable does. Now, quick little funny story. About the third semester I was using these slides, one of the students said, and I think I've told you this more than once, I'll be the first one down when I was in grade school and high school. Grade school, really, I was the first one down to spelling bee. Hands down, I don't spell well. And instead of having saponifiable and non saponifiable well, no, I'm getting ahead of myself. It was another wrong story. It, but anyways, what are saponifiable lipids? And those are fats and oils. And those are fats and oils. And you should know saponifiable lipid is a fat or an oil. Now, what are fats and oils? They're triesters, tri means three, of glycerol or glycerin. Now, they're also called triglycerides. And do I have time? I do. A number of years ago, I was looking for a new doctor, general practitioner, or internist, and someone recommended, because I had uh, this practice, and I live in Schaumburg, called NCH Group, North, uh, Northwest Community Hospital Group. And they recommended one doctor who was really good, and luckily, his, their main that center in Schaumburg is five minutes drive time from my house, which is nice. So first time I went, was able to get in and luckily his practice wasn't full. So he was able to take me as a patient and new patients, first thing they do is let's schedule before I even met him, but I'd heard good things about him, Dr. Canner. Uh, you need a full physical I'll give you and we'll also do a blood test. And we'll talk from there. So I went and had the physical. 
had the blood test. And a couple of days later, I get a call from him. And I say, he says, we have to talk. And I said, what's wrong? He said, your physical and blood results. So he calls me in. The thing I like about certain doctors, and Dr. Kanner is one of them, unfortunately, because of back problems a couple of years ago, I have to retire. And another doctor in that same practice, she's just as good as he is, Dr. Velarosa. I'm lucky to get in her because she's not even taking any more patients. She's so good and booked up. But anyways, calls me in, said, we got to talk about your health. I said, you know, your blood pressure is too high. And said, yeah. He said, well, one of the reasons is look at your triglycerides. And those are the fats caused from the fats and oils I was consuming in foods. And he said, at this level and your blood pressure, and he showed me something he pulled up on the screen from the internet. We were in his office. He said, you're in the 95% group that if you don't do anything, you're going to be dead in five years. Boy, did that get my attention quick. And I like that kind of straightforward talk. Some people might not. I do. And we worked, and I brought my um, triglycerides down and other things. I'm taking medication for my blood pressure. Got my weight down, too. That was another thing. Another thing, keep your salt level down. And that was in 2015, and I'm still alive. Thank you. And that whole group is super good. I've done with other specialists. I have a cardiologist because my age and my blood pressure is great. And his other colleagues are great. And I even had the problem two summers ago with a dermatologist in that group. They have a bunch of them and they're great. And by the way, I'm not doing their commercial. So fats and oils is a triester of glycerol known as a triglyceride. Now, Ken, you should know. There are a few definitions I'd like you to know. What's a fat? A fat is a triglyceride that's a solid or semi-solid at room temperature. And for those who are wondering what's room temperature, that's defined, you don't have to know this, but 25 degrees C, which I believe is 77 degrees Fahrenheit. What's a semi-solid? Have you ever had butter out on a dish for a while, like for dinner, and you put the knife in there, or <laughs> if you wanted to, don't, put your finger in there and it goes squishy. It's sort of not a solid but it's not a liquid, and we call that a semi-solid. Another example of a semi-solid, at least I would call that, is mayonnaise. Even though that's not considered a true fat, I'll talk more about mayonnaise later in this chapter. Oh, we're gonna get into some good stuff. But anyways, you should know, a triglyceride that's a solid or semi-solid at room temperature, we call a fat. An oil, is a triglyceride that's a liquid at room temperature. And if you have in your house vegetable oil and it's been not in the refrigerator, it's a liquid. How many of you have ever cooked, I don't know, bacon or hamburgers in a frying pan, take the food out, and later when the frying pan is cooled down, you see the fat from the bacon or hamburger has solidified. And we call it a fat because it's a solid or sol semi-solid at room temperature. You heat up a fat, becomes a liquid. Guess what? If you take an oil and put it in your refrigerator, it becomes a solid. But what is a fat? A triglyceride that's a solid or semi-solid at room temperature. What's an oil? A triglyceride that's a liquid at room temperature. And the company I worked for dealt mainly in fats because it was cheaper than oils. And we used to have delivered, and I'll talk more about it, about two to three million pounds a week 
of beef fat, which is called tallow, or pig's fat. There are two types, yellow grease and white grease. Why am I being subtle today? All right, hint, know this. What's the general structure? Remember, this is material and same thing, I forgot to mention, polymers, test four, not test three. Now, chemists who work in fats and oils are called oil chemists. Not to be confused with people who work with crude oil are called petroleum chemists. And yes, I have been a oil chemist. And this is a general structure you should know of a fat or oil. Ester number one, ester number two, ester number three. Now, fats and oils chemists write their esters reverse from synthetic organic chemists, which I am also. And this first one, think of this. And then the second one, Esther, where the R and R prime are reversed, and the third ester, and these R groups are connected together right here. So you have one, two, three, three esters. And all fats and oils have this same structure. The difference is what's R, what's R prime, and what's R double prime. And because I'm not really supposed to talk about this until next week, guess what? I'm gonna end a little early because we're way ahead of schedule, which is a good thing as opposed to rushing behind schedule. And I'm gonna say, gang gesund, goodbye, I'm done.